Well, my name is Paul Lenson. I'm 67 years of age, and the reason I mention that is because I spent most of my adult life very seriously mentally ill. Research indicates that over half of all jail and prison inmates have a mental health problem, and the majority of these individuals don't receive any treatment. To understand how we got here, we need to start by taking a look back. Before the American Revolution, colonial jails existed, but only for those people who were awaiting trial or to hold them briefly after sentencing. It isn't until after the American Revolution, with the growth of populations in cities, that we see the rise of a more structured U.S. prison system. However, throughout the 19th century, people with mental illness were largely confined to these jails and prisons. By the early 1820s, people started to realize how inhumane and unethical it was to incarcerate such people. So in 1843, Dorothea Dix delivers her impassioned report to the legislature of Massachusetts. From this, she said, I proceed, gentlemen, briefly to call your attention to the present state of insane persons confined within this commonwealth in cages, closets, cellars, stalls, pens, chained, naked, beaten with rods, and lashed into obedience. Within 40 years, there were 75 hospitals created for people to receive asylum and treatment rather than imprisonment. But these places were not much better. And throughout the wars, not a whole lot changed there either. Then by the 1950s, there were numerous advances in antipsychotic drugs that helped people to manage their mental disorders. This leads to the deinstitutionalization movement which was about taking mental health services out of the hands of institutions and putting them into community-based programs. And in 1963, President Kennedy signs the Community Mental Health Act. And third, hearings begin in the Senate this week on our bills to combat mental illness and mental retardation. Almost every American family at some stage will experience or has experienced a case of mental affliction. And we have to offer something more than crowded custodial care in our state institutions. Our task is to prevent these conditions. Our next is to treat them more effectively and sympathetically in the patient's own community. I hope the Congress will act on this bill. By the mid-1980s, many states in the U.S. had built the foundation for a comprehensive community-based and person-centered mental health service system that achieved much of what President Kennedy addressed in 1963. As the decade ended, however, both the federal and state governments began a long retreat from this progression. The exact reasons for this unraveling are not entirely clear. We may summarize, however, that it reflects the influence of a growing indifference in the nation's moral culture to the needs of the mentally ill. Which begs the question, what has changed since the 1980s? The answer might surprise you. This is a documentary that was filmed by Frederick Wiseman in 1967. It takes place at Bridgewater State Hospital in Massachusetts. It's 84 minutes of raw film intended to show how inhumane these institutions were, and why they were not a place for recovery. In the spirit of knowing the history of how we got here, we feel it is equally important to include the efforts in public awareness, such as this, that precede us. This is a scene from Frontline's Locked Up. It takes place 47 years after Wiseman's groundbreaking documentary. And yet, it looks all too familiar. The Community Mental Health Act succeeded by stopping the use of large mental health facilities and inhumane practices. However, it failed in replacing those institutions with anything sustainable. So the country just regressed back to using prisons to absorb these populations. Over a decade ago, Frontline captured the story of this man, who was one such victim of that regression. Well, what's all this for? Oh, yeah. No use of force is necessary. Mm -hmm. Convicted initially for burglary, Carl McEachran returned to prison in 1988 when he violated his parole by stealing a bicycle. A little more background. Carl was seven years old when he was removed from his household for being abused. 
spending much of his teenage years growing up in an Ohio center for boys. According to studies done by the CDC, childhood abuse greatly increases the chances of mental illness. For nearly a decade, McEachran's disciplinary problems led him to spiral down through the Ohio prison system, from medium security to maximum security, and eventually to the supermax. If you're mentally ill when you go into segregation, you're going to become worse, invariably. If you're not mentally ill, the risk of becoming mentally ill is very high from isolation. Some people dispute that, but in my experience, the people who are so unsocialized and so psychologically fragile to, de to begin with are deprived of any kind of social support, any kind of psychological stimulus, and they just, they just fall apart. McEachern spent years in solitary confinement, and eventually his psychological problems became obvious. He didn't speak for nearly a year. He began crawling down the cell block on his hands and knees. He told officers that there were cameras in his eyes. It seemed like a hopeless situation because was just, I was just going down. It's for falling into this, uh, this abyss, or how would you pronounce it? Abyss. Abyss? <laughs> okay. And it's, it's like, you're, 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 that's it. It's like, ah, oh, it's, it's, it's everybody there. You say, help, you know what I'm saying? And it's, it's, it's really, there's hopeless. Carl McEachran has been in prison for over 16 years. Because of his disciplinary problems, he never became eligible for parole and has been held 13 years beyond the sentencing guidelines for his crime. I see the parole board next month. And it's, there is some hope there. It took 13 years for the staff to declare that Carl's behavior could be because of mental illness. But how and why did it take that long before they even posed the possibility? This just outlines the inherent problems we face when prisons act in the stead of mental health facilities. Prisons were not and still are not equipped to care for people with mental disorders. The staff have little training, and the facilities themselves are not healthy environments to progress. Is it really a good idea to take someone with severe social disorders and throw them into a small cell with barely any social interaction? How can we expect anyone to function with their disorder by giving them the absolute worst environment they could have? This brings up the question, what are we doing about this right now? And there are actually several things being done to divert incarceration. The first is diversion pre-incident meaning local police are being trained to handle specific situations with better understanding. In our research, we found that San Antonio is at the forefront of such training. A specialized team is working to revolutionize policing from within. They're San Antonio's mental health unit. She's calling in stating that she has depression and that she's feeling suicidal. Meet Patrolman Joe Smarr with Ernie Stevens. They're tasked with responding to calls involving emotionally disturbed persons anywhere in the city. Hi, my name's Ernie. You call the police? But I promise you that I'm not like any police officer that you've probably ever met. Today, it's a young woman who called 911 contemplating suicide. Have you ever attempted suicide in the past? No. No. I don't even know how to do it. Okay, so you don't have a plan right now? No. Right. These officers are experts in what's called crisis intervention training. It's all part of a pioneering program where the mentally ill are diverted out of jails and into treatment. How is your approach different from the average cop, if you will? It's actually the complete opposite. We're in plain clothes. We have an unmarked car. You know, we walk in, it's not, hey, I'm Officer Smarrow, this is Officer Stevens. It's, how you doing, Byron? My name is Joe. This is Ernie. We're just here to help you. Less than 25% of law enforcement agencies in America have CIT training programs. The average police officer in America receives only eight hours of training on handling persons with mental illness. In comparison, they receive 60 hours of gun training. In addition to preventing fatal results, CIT training also saves money. According to the Center for Healthcare Services in San Antonio, it has saved the city almost $50 million over a five-year period. We think the program that San Antonio is using should be a model for all other agencies in the country. For more information on the program, check the video description below. Another tactic is diversion post-incident. 
specifically something referred to as mental health courts. These are voluntary systems put into place to try and divert those who have committed a crime, sending them to a community-based treatment rather than going directly to prison. We had the privilege to talk to Judge Lerner Wren, who pioneered the first specialized mental health court back in 1997. As they were losing their children, their adult children, to the jail system, they were getting enmeshed in the criminal justice system. And I thought, you know, at the very least, the court would be a symbol. I, I mean this, that we would show our community families who were in crisis, you had a judge that got it, that understood that the criminalization of people with mental illnesses was absolutely unacceptable, and that in Broward we were going to do something. There's over an hour of excellent interview material that you can check out right here. Another extremely important role in diverting is community-based help. We were lucky to stumble upon a hidden gem, an unexpected find that filled us with optimism and hope. Nine Muses is a project designed to provide mental health support and recovery through fine arts. We spent nearly three days getting to know staff and consumers alike. It was one of the most therapeutic and uplifting experiences we have ever seen. A real working art gallery. It's, it's staffed by artists. Uh, it's not a therapy program, it's an art program, you know, so the, the main tenet of that program is to connect people to one another because we know that one of the things that, that happens when someone gets diagnosed with a mental illness is they become isolated socially, emotionally, and so it's an opportunity for us to help people reconnect to other people. That's really our primary mission, is getting people connected to one another. They understand what the resources are and that there are other people out there that will help them. This is Olivia, and those paintings you see behind her are all her own. She graciously took time to tell us about her life and how Nine Muses helps her personally. The Nine Muses is the first time I've been around other people. Um, I stay in a house by myself and with my mom, and no family affairs, no picnics, no nothing. Um, I don't have other people my age or anybody that I talked to for many years, since 2010. So my caseworker brought me here, um, and at first I was a little scared, scared to be around people um, scared of germs, scared of everything, because you're alone and secluded. And being here helped me tremendously. I started back painting and drawing, which I haven't done in over nine years. Um, being around people, I enjoy it, and I enjoy being here. I just started back driving last year because my brother gave me a vehicle because I didn't drive, I didn't go anywhere. So this is the only place that I actually go. And my mom and everybody know I'm safe, I feel safe here and I enjoy being here and art is like an outlet for me and it relaxes me. I don't know what I would do without Nine Muse. It's not just, just the art alone, it's the environment and the people that's here that's running it and the people that come here for support or relaxation or um, some type of outlet for their own self or just want to come and learn from the teachers and I'm a new arts and craft type of project or how to paint or how to do something. Um, sometimes I come when I don't feel good, but I know when I get here, I'll be okay. Just to get out the house and not be secluded again. Um, I think if Nine Muse wasn't here, I would, I don't, if they just up and disappeared on me one day, put it that way, it would be really a real scary feeling for me. It, it really would because, um, This is the only place I have, and I know. I can't explain to people all the time. But it helped me a whole lot, and, and 
I don't never want it to go away. And I like everybody that's here, and I like being able to have somewhere to come that I feel safe and comfortable and enjoy what I like doing. We think Nine Muses should be a model for communities everywhere. Words, statistics, and science cannot describe what it's like to be in such a place. Just the small amount of people we got to talk to about how it helped them prevent an incident, manage their health, or recover back into society, it was incredible. It's a place where anyone can walk in and ask for help. We have hours of heartfelt stories that we wish we could fit into this video. But you can check out a lot of that material right here. So, what's next? Up until the 1980s, the United States was making progress after JFK's 1963 speech to Congress regarding our treatment of those with mental illness. Mysteriously, we have backtracked our progress since then, likely due to renewed stigma of mental illness in combination with budget cuts and government austerity. The U.S. needs to construct a comprehensive continuum of services and supports for persons of all ages needing mental health care. It's a national disgrace that resources required to build and maintain a full continuum of community-based mental health services and life supports were not made available so many years ago. In the absence of a continuum of care, we have allowed a massive amount of avoidable suffering to afflict millions of Americans. In 2012, there was an estimated 356,000 inmates with severe mental illness in prisons and jails. Compare this to the roughly 35,000 patients with severe mental illness in state psychiatric hospitals. That's 10 times more people held in jail or prison instead of state hospitals. Through our political representatives, we have allowed our criminal justice system to become a principal site for the very limited amount of care we have been willing to provide for the last three decades. Despite all of this regression and tragic mishandling of American citizens, very positive initiatives have been started. San Antonio's prevention team, mental health courts, and Nine Muses are all excellent examples of what people can do to promote positive change in fighting stigma and the unjustified incarceration of people with mental illness. The time for mental health reform is now, and it's our moral responsibility as American citizens to make these changes happen. I've experienced incarceration, and uh, it's a brutal dehumanizing environment. The people who commit to know what they're doing and commit serious criminal acts, too bad. But for people who are not in their right mind, do not have all their faculties, uh, I think a lot more uh, successful outcome for everybody concerned would be if they really took a good look at the person and said maybe rather than putting them in a prison cell, we should put them in a hospital and get them some treatment. And if that had happened to me, I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. Thank you.